All right, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's so good to have you all back for Fish On. Better late than never. We got a little late start this year, but it is wonderful to see you all here. Um, I first of all want to thank the Friends of Memorial Hall Library for sponsoring this series year after year. Um, couldn't do it without them. And of course, I have to say, thank Skip Montello for finding all the speakers, bringing some great swag for all of you. Um, and so, with those two thanks, um, I appreciate them and I appreciate you all for being here. Uh, tonight we have Finn Holly. We'll be talking about uh, the ever-changing striped bass, bass fishery. Um, we have an event next Tuesday as well with Eric Roach talking about American Shad. And on March 12th, we will have Eric Harrison um, talking about striper fishing. Um, that is rescheduled from the one that was supposed to be last week. So please join us for those upcoming events as well. Um, and now we can get on to some, we can, we can get on to some raffles. Hopefully everyone has a ticket. Let's get this thing started. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And it's going to be a really fun night of talking fishing, which I'm super excited for. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about surf casting and my whole philosophy behind what I do from day to day when I'm out fishing. So over the last five years, I've seen a dramatic change in the striped bass fishery. It's almost as if it's completely different from season to season. A great example of this is, a few years ago, I had a spot I could go to every single day at the same tide, in the same place, didn't really matter the conditions, and I could almost guarantee a shot at a big fish. Next season, I go back to that same place and I fish the best conditions possible and I don't get one bass over 40 inches out of that spot, not one. When the year before, I had a dozen or so really nice quality bass like that out of the spot. Because of inconsistencies like that one, it can often feel like the striped bass are completely random where and when they're feeding. It is difficult to be consistent when you're surf casting, but there are a few things that striped bass will do no matter what. And I refer to these as hard patterns. A great example of a hard pattern is the striped bass migration. So throughout the striped bass migration, we're gonna have localized abundance for a few weeks in the spring. Then we're gonna have localized abundance again for a few weeks in the fall. Throughout the season, the striped bass will be spread out basically from Virginia all the way to Maine. So during the spring run, hence the name spring run, the time of year is spring. So the striped bass are going to be trying to find the warmest water possible to stage up. There's also two main bait fish spawns happening at this time. The first one is sand eels, and the second one is herring. And those are the two that I focus on. And just those two alone are things that will happen every single season no matter what. And Robbie told me, by the way, that I had to say that he outcaught me this day if I use this. So, yeah, yeah. During the spring, I spend most of the time in the rivers and estuaries on Cape Ann. That's where the water temperature is going to be the coolest, and that's also where the bait fish are spawning. So now, if you think about that, we got. The, the bait fish themselves spawning as hard patterns. You have the time of year, which is spring, and those bass are trying to seek out that nice warm water in the estuary to stage up and feed. 
So they're going to be going into the estuaries, and, and that's where I'm going to be spending most of my time because now I know I have those patterns that no matter what, there's going to be big fish, or not big fish in general, but there's going to be fish in general in there staging up as well as some, some big fish. So in the spring, I fish three main lures during the day. The first one is the SBH sand eel from Puma Plugs. I'll just pass, if you guys just want to pass this down so everyone can see it, just be careful with the hooks, even though there is some hook prote protectors on them. This is a great small profile lure that I like to work that mimics the sand eels. And what I like to do is work it by reeling slow and twitching the tip of my rod at a pretty fast rhythmic pace to get that to walk across the surface of the water. I just want to make sure I grab the lure. The right one. The next lure I use a lot is from Puma Plugs is the Walker. This is a great small spook style plug. And I really like this plug because I can work it really nice and slow across the surface of the water. And in the spring, it's best to really work these plugs nice and slow on the surface and to get to give the bass as much time as possible to see them and then go up and, and hit them. And then the third and final lure that I use a lot in the spring is the Yozuri Hydro Pencil. And this is a great little spook style plug that dives under the surface of the water. So I'll work it like a spook and then I'll pull it to get it to dive under the surface of the water and kick and swim. This is fantastic when you're feeding, when the bass are feeding on really picky bait fish. I also want to say that I forgot to mention this at the start. I would love if you have any questions at any time, just raise your hand and I'll call on you guys and we can go in more in depth on anything that you all want to uh, talk about. All right. Can you mention the season of the spring? Yep. When, what months? So April, May, middle of April. Monday. Yeah, great question. So in so we on Cape Ann, at least where I personally fish, the striped bass start to show up in the first, or I guess the last week of April, first week or so of May, and then we have a lot of our bigger bass that'll show up end of May, maybe the last week or so of May, generally, and. Into, the, into June. And it was really funny because this last season, we had a really early start to the year as far as big fish go. Like we had a lot of nice quality bass even by the second week of May. And who knows if that's gonna be the case going forward, but there's a chance that there will be some bigger bass earlier than there has been. This is actually at night, this video. So I know it's a little dark and kind of hard to see, but at night I use a lot of straight tail soft plastic. So I'm just gonna pass around a few of these that I use at night. Uh, this one is the Zinger Bates Bomba Shad, and then I have a Gravity Tackle GT Eel. So I'll just pass these along as well, if you wanna pass that down. And these are fantastic because what I like to do is work them as slow as possible in the spring. So during the springtime, these bass are going to be a little bit pickier because the water temperature is going to be a little bit cooler. And I like to fish them either weightless or I'll fish them with at most about a half ounce of weight because I really want to fish them as slow as I can fish them. And even though like you'll see the gravity tackle eel is a pretty big lure, in the spring there's some really nice solid bass in there and they, they really work. They're, they're a lot of fun to fish. When striped bass are feeding on specific bait fish, they tend to act in certain predictable ways. A great example of this is, oh, actually, before I get into that, I just wanted to say I love this fish, especially this picture, but I really love this fish because this day I was on a beach fishing and there's, I was talking to some other guys that were fishing on the beach and they're like, oh, I fish on this beach all the time. I've never caught any big fish out of, on, off of this beach before. And it was in the fall when we had some peanut bunker blitzes going on. And so what I did was I got really lucky and I saw this fish jump out of the water and I fired my plug right where it jumped out of the water. And of course, luckily enough, that fish came up and ate it and it was a really solid, nice bass, probably the biggest bass I ended up catching that fall. So that was a really fun fish. 
So when striped bass are on white bait, they tend to be really aggressive and they, they will a lot of the time jump out of the water, completely out of the water when they're following your plug because they really, really want to eat it. And, and that's what makes it just the most fun thing for them to really be on, in my opinion, is when they're on big white bait like mackerel, herring, uh, and Atlantic menhaden, which we're going to get into here a little bit more. And these, uh, I'm going to tell a story coming up here in a little bit, and the next like few pictures are all from that one day. So, my favorite bait for them to be on, as I was saying, is the Atlantic menhaden. Menhaden are a fantastic bait for them to be on because the bass tend to be really big, and they, again, they're very aggressive. Menhaden are very interesting fish though, so a lot of the time when you find one school of menhaden, they'll actually chain out up and down the coast. And so you'll have pods like this stretching for miles in each direction, which is a really interesting is that, phenomenon. Excuse me, Finn, is yep. that dark cloud the fish? Yes, so you can see that this whole section right here is fish, and then actually in here, you, there's a bunch of cormorants feeding on them, and every once in a while you'll see like there's a bass that just flashed there. Oh. I think there's a bass that pops up right here somewhere. But that just is, these are actually dollar bill sized pogies, or Atlantic Menhaden, they go by many names, or large peanut bunker. But this gives you a general sense of what it would look like when the bass are heckling the school of bait, and they're pushing them up onto the surface like this. This is a really unique view, so what I look for from shore is nervous water, and this shows you some nervous water here. This is all adult menhaden, right here. And there's bass actually pushing right up here, up onto the surface. So if you're looking for these fish, this is what you'll see from shore. This is a great shot, and I actually forgot that I, I had this video, and I was so excited when I found it because it really shows you, and I, I'm gonna replay it because I love it so much. <laughs> Is there a way of knowing if they're menhaden or bluefish? I mean, men, bluefish or stripers? Um, it, sometimes it's a mix. Uh, bluefish tend to splash a lot. So what will happen is when you see a like bluefish feeding on bait, they'll fly out of the water and they splash a whole lot more than bass. Not that bass won't splash, but they can definitely like you'll there's once you see like a big bluefish blitz, you'll see like they're hammering the bait yeah. and splashing water all over the place. I'm gonna replay this one more time because I love it so much. But uh, yeah, so you can see like we got the nervous water right here and it's also a slightly different coloration too. So there's a couple of different things I look for when I'm looking for the pogies. And one is the color change in the water and then the other one's the nervous water. The last thing that really hammers it home is if you can see bass or birds working on them. Oftentimes there'll at least be a few cormorants going through the school and there'll be a lot of gulls around feeding on them as well. Just gonna point out the gulls are where, you know, where the birds are and where the feed is gonna happen. Definitely, yep. Um, Find the birds. And menhaden are a very interesting bait fish as well because there is a pretty prolific commercial fishery for them. And us as land based anglers can actually use this to our advantage. And what will happen is these uh, commercial fishing boats will hire airplanes, spotter planes, that will fly up and down the coast, and they'll be looking for the Menhaden schools, and then they'll be radioing down to these boats that will go and they'll net the schools of Menhaden. We can use this to our advantage because they have pretty distinctive looking boats. They have a big crane that comes off the back, and they're oftentimes carrying a big net. Sometimes they'll be on the side of the boat. But what, this, what the boats will do is the boats will give away the general area that the pogies are in. So if you see a, a Menhaden boat, I know I keep saying different names for them, they're Atlantic Menhaden, but they go by many different names. Uh, when you see the boat, they'll give off the general area that the Menhaden are in. And you can use that by driving up and down the coast and looking at where these boats are and then looking around in that area for those bait schools that we just saw. There's one day in particular that I really think about when I think about Menhaden. And a few years ago, there was a ton of Atlantic Menhaden around. And I knew this and I was driving up and down 127, looking at every piece of water that I could look at. 
because ultimately it doesn't matter if the structure itself is the best. If those bass can push the bait close enough to shore for you to get a shot in it, they sometimes will be in places that you would never imagine there to be big schools of, of menhaden. So this day I'm driving up and down 127 and I, I'm looking through my binoculars and I see a pogey boat out netting. And so I drive as close to that boat as I can. And I'm looking around and I'm looking and I see that there's a little dark patch of water in the corner of this cove. And I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, you know, it could be a rock because there's a lot of rocks in this cove and I'm not super familiar with it, but there was a, there was a cormorant swimming around in it and I'm looking at it and then all of a sudden there's this big explosion and a bass jumps out of the water chasing pogies. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're there. So I dump my car and I grab my gear and I'm sprinting to get to them because a lot of the time these pogie schools are moving fast. So you won't even get very many shots into the schools of pogies. And so I sprint, I'm going through the woods, I burst out of the woods and I'm climbing up over this, the rocks and I look down and to my surprise, they're actually still there. And they're tightly balled together with some big bass heckling them on the outside. And it was just awesome to see. So I quickly threw on a pencil popper and I cast it about eight feet to the left of that pogey school. And the reason I cast it eight feet to the left of the pogey school and not right over the top of it was because sometimes if you cast over the top of the pogey school, you're probably gonna hook a bass, but there's a chance that you'll actually spook the fish. And you wanna try to get as many chances as possible into that school and try to catch as many bass as you can out of the school. So, what I, so I, I cast it out to the left of the school, a little bit away from the, the actual pod of bait and fishing while I was fishing the fringes of it. And I get pack attacked by some really nice solid sized bass. I end up landing a nice low 40 inch bass, which was this one right here. And I, I, that actually kept happening. So those pogies kept getting pushed back into the corner of this cove. And that was really surprising to me because all of my prior experiences when I was fishing with pogies was they were moving a million miles an hour down the coast and I would get like one cast into them and then they'd be gone. And you might get one blow up or you might get one fish, but then they'd be gone. This school lasted maybe three hours. They kept pushing them back into the cove and back into the cove. And I caught probably eight bass that day that were all really nice solid size fish. And that day to me just totally stands out because it's something that I, you know, I haven't even really seen since. I mean, it was just, it was a very fun day of fishing. There are some years though, where there's not a whole lot of white bait around. And when that is the case, I look for a certain type of structure that I call rock reef structure. Rock reef structure to me is similar to a boulder field, but there is one key difference. And that is if you go into a rock reef area and you flip over a rock, you're gonna see crabs, lobsters, maybe even eels underneath those rocks. And sometimes you'll have two boulder fields that have very similar structure and they both look like they should hold fish. But one for whatever reason seems to hold way more bass than the other one. And I'll go to, so I'll be in that one boulder field where there, there seems to be more bait and, and it always seems to hold more fish because of it. And the bass know, like they really know what boulder field is gonna have the most bait in it. And that's why I kind of call it a rock reef structure because it attracts so much life to it that those fish, they, they know where, where it is and they'll oftentimes stage up on those rock reef areas, sometimes for an entire summer. And it can be a really, really consistent bite but sometimes, well, but they can be really picky and the windows that they feed in are really short. So you'll have bass that are, are there and sometimes it can be really hard to catch them. This past season, I really discovered the power of wetsuiting. Now, wetsuiting, for those of you who don't know, is way crazier than you could ever imagine. So, Basically, there's about three different ways you can do it. I kind of look at it like this. The first way is you put on a wetsuit and you swim out in the water 
and you fish without your feet touching the ground and you're just swimming. And people call that skishing and that's just crazy. I don't do that. Hook a big fish, put your gold right down. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Nantucket sleigh ride. Yeah, right. Yep. The second way is where you stand, you're standing on the bottom, but you're still gonna be out in the water. Maybe you're like neck or chest deep in the water and you're, you're in the water and you're fishing. I do that, but that's also still a little crazy. The third way that I fish, and this is the way that I fish probably the most, is I will use the wetsuit to help me get out further, maybe 100 or so yards out in the water, and then I'll climb up onto a rock and fish off of it. So wetsuits are pretty awesome. Um, let me just show you the wet wetsuit that I use here. So I recently upgraded to a five mil wetsuit. I used to have a two mil wetsuit. And the reason I upgraded to a five mil wetsuit is because when you're in the water for like three or four hours and the water's 60 degrees, when you're wearing a two mil wetsuit, you get so cold. And my teeth were chattering. And I was fishing with a few guys. I'm like, how are you guys not cold right now? And they're like, well, we're wearing five mil wetsuits. And I'm like, I'm in a two mil. And they're like, you're crazy. And I'm like, yeah, that was the dumb, dumbest thing I could have done. So I'm like freezing to death. And I was like, that night or that next day, I just went and bought one because I was freezing to death. And the five mil wetsuit's awesome. So not only are you gonna stay a lot warmer because you're not actively moving around when you're really fishing, you're kind of just sitting there and hopefully you're catching fish. So like that's gonna warm you up a little bit, but you're gonna be in the water and it cools you down pretty fast. So I, I like to have like a little bit bigger wetsuit. I also like to fish, uh, you know, it, it keeps you a little bit more buoyant as well, which is the other great thing about it. The, uh, the wetsuit, especially being the five mil, will help you on the safety end of this. And that's a big thing I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking like, this is nuts. And I definitely suggest not doing this by yourself. Like it's stupid to fish in a wetsuit by yourself it, because it's very dangerous. You can get yourself in a pickle real quick. And I've seen people, you know, blow their knees out. And when you're out there in the water and you get hit off a rock, it's, it's dumb. So don't or at least have one person with you or really, really know the area if you're gonna fish it at night. Because if you don't know the area, that's again, even crazier. So definitely know the area if you're gonna fish it at night. All right, let's bring it back to the- uh, Is that a diver's suit? Uh, this is just a O'Neill wetsuit. Um, or, Did you buy it at a dive shop? Uh, I bought it at Surfari in Gloucester, if any of you guys know that place. Yeah, it's like a, sur it's a, yeah, like a surfing wetsuit. Yes, so I'll be wearing my, uh, my corkers with sp spikes. Yeah. So I, I wear, I have a uh, waterproof backpack and it kind of acts as a flotation device. But you're right, it would be a lot smarter to, to have a flotation device with you if you're by yourself. And if you are going to wetsuit, even if you are with someone, make sure you're a really competent swimmer too, because it's a lot harder than you'd imagine to swim when you have big boots like that on. Like, so. it's crazy. <laughs> so definitely if you're going to do this whole wetsuiting thing, make sure you have, you know, you're at least good at swimming or you have somebody with you. All right. So... When, let's talk about the uh, rock reef structure again. So in the rock reef structure, I look at two main things when I, it comes to the feeding windows. And the first one is, I look at general habits that the striped bass tend to follow. So the general habits would be, striped bass really like moving water. So if you have a big tide, that's gonna make those fish feed a little harder. If you have a big low pressure system, that's gonna make the fish feed a little harder. If the water is cool and clean, the bass are gonna to wanna to stage up. So those are like bass specific factors. The other thing that I look for is spot dependent factors. So this would be dependent on the spot, what is the best tide to fish it? And where, like what's the best tide to fish it? Where is the best uh, like structure within that spot? What wind direction fish, fish is best in that area? So you have a bunch of different factors that different spots will fish differently. The only real way to figure out spot specific factors is to fish. There's no real way to get around that. 
it's you just got to put your time in. And if you put your time in, there's nothing more rewarding than putting your time in and then actually catching bass when it's slow and no one else is doing anything because that's it's just so much fun to be able to be in your own spot quietly doing well. So there's this one night that I always think about in a, in a rock reef area that I fished. This past July, it was deep into the dog days of summer. There's not a whole lot of fish being caught, especially not a whole lot of big bass being caught at this point. And there's a storm blowing by offshore and the storm was kicking up big ground swells. And ground swells, for those of you who don't know, are big, deep, powerful waves that are generated by storms offshore. And striped bass love this because those big, powerful waves are gonna move a lot of water, and that water movement is really gonna make good ambush points for these striped bass. So I knew that all of these factors were going on, and the other thing that was happening is it was kicking up a little bit of wind. And that wind happened to be a good wind for one of my favorite rock reef areas to fish. So the last thing that I needed was the tide. I needed the tide to be right. And it just so happened that the tide that fished best in that spot was a mid-incoming tide. And mid-incoming tide that day was about 8, 10 p.m. And in mid-July, that's bright. That's daylight hours. And as many of you know, striped bass like to feed a lot at night, are a little bit more aggressive at night. And I, I was like, well, my window that was already going to be short is now going to be even shorter. But I figured, what the heck? I'm going to go. I'm going to fish it. And maybe I'll see something at night that I wouldn't have seen if I was fishing during the, uh, fishing at night, I wouldn't see because I can see it during the day. So I, I go out to that spot, I put on this soft plastic right here, which is again, you, I fished a lot of straight tail soft plastics this year. This is the Zinger Baits, like eight inch Bomba Shad on a uh, gravity tackle jig head. I really love this lure. It was kind of a confidence plug for me this year. So I threw this on and I cast it out and I saw the current line, so I cast it out. I'm not expecting a whole lot. The lure hits the water and it drops down and I feel it hit the bottom and I, I bounce it up. And I feel it swing and swing and swing and then bam, I get in, hooked into a big fish. And it's completely broad daylight out. I end up landing that bass and it was a nice like low 40 inch class fish. And I, I was just shocked and I was like, that fish alone made my night. So I ended up releasing that bass and I was hoping, well, you know, it's still early, maybe I'll get a chance and get lucky enough to get a, another one. So I climb back up onto the rock and I cast back out again and the same thing happens. Bam, I'm into another fish. This time it's maybe a little bit better. I end up having unbelievably hot fishing that night. Like it was every single cast to the point that there was sometimes where I was hooking into fish, dropping them, and then having another bass eat it. And they're all cookie cutter sized fish. This is actually one of the fish from that night that I caught. So they're all about that size. That was one of the smaller ones, but one of the better photos. So I was like, I might as well use that photo. Um, but it was a really awesome fish. And you can see I was stoked to get onto them because it was slow. And so I ended up catching a bunch of really nice fish and it was really hot like that all the way up to right around high tide. And then like somebody flipped a switch, that bite died. I didn't get one hit, not one. And I'm like, that's so weird. So I was like, well, maybe the bass will start feeding again once the water moves. So I wait till the other side of the tide. I'm like, I'm gonna fish two hours into the outgoing tide and see if those fish start picking up again and actually start feeding a little bit better. And I fish two hours into the outgoing tide. I don't get one hit. So that really shows you that when you have spot dependent factors that are good, having the wind direction be right, having the tide be right, those bass were feeding. And then on top of that, having those fish dependent things like having those big ground swells coming in and having a lot of water movement and the right tide as we were talking about is made those fish feed more aggressively than they otherwise would have. So maybe on an average night with no really good conditions, I might've gotten a shot at maybe one nice fish, but having all of those other conditions with those big ground swells in the wind made that night 100% better. Yep. With the wind, is it with like boulder fields, is it best if it's coming at you towards the boulder field or out to sea? So I really like it when the wind's blowing at me. And there's a few places 
where when you fish it and the wind's blowing at you, it'll, it will get really dirty and warm. Sometimes though, if you have a little bit of a crosswind and the wind's blowing at you and it's, it's blowing at you and there's a little bit of a crosswind, you'll have that water actually cool down and clean out a bit. And for whatever reason, I, I, to me, it, I feel like it makes a difference, but there, again, like there are fish, like from time to time they break that rule, but it feels like to me that that makes a big difference when you have either a crosswind or if it's blowing at your face and it's not, the water's not getting too dirty or warm, those bass tend to stage up. But that's like something that I found when I fish from time to time, like the wind direction really makes a difference for me personally. So sand beaches are another place to me that when there's not a whole lot of like mackerel or herring or pogies around, like I'll go to a sand beach because the bass tend, well, the sand beaches tend to attract their own kind of biome of bait. And what will happen is these big bass will go and they'll stage up on them throughout the summer. And it can be really, really productive fishing. There's th so much structure on sand beaches that are really, really good. Like there's a lot of great structure. There's one structure in particular that to me is by far and away the most fun to fish and that is sand flats. Sand flats are amazing because there's not a whole lot of water in them. So, and for those of you who don't know, sand flats are a horizontal plane that's tidal. So it's gonna be dry at low tide and there'll be a couple of feet of water on it at high tide. And there oftentimes is a good amount of current when involved in it as well. And I almost look at these sand flats like, like a grassland. And these striped bass are coming up onto these sand flats and they're grazing on sand eels, shrimp, crabs, whatever's on those, those beaches at the time. And when I fish these sand flats, it's, it's so much fun to me because you have, you have shallow water, so you have these, these bass, and when they hit in the shallow water, there's, their tails are coming out of the water, they're trying to gain traction, and then once they gain traction, they're off, because there's nowhere for them to go down. They have to go straight out. And your drag is screaming, as well as a lot of the time you're out like 100 or so yards, because it's, it's a pretty far distance that it's the same depth, and so you have no wave noise at all. And so you have the fish screaming, and the, one of the best parts as well is there's nothing for them to break you off on. So you just get to maintain tension to that lot, to your fish and, and enjoy the fight. And that's what makes it so much fun. But there's even one thing that makes it even better. And if you look up in the corner of this photo, the moon phase up there is in the middle of the moon phase, which means that the tide was actually pretty small. And for a lot of us, including myself, I'd always really struggled when it came to not having a whole lot of water movement, I always really needed big moon tides in order to generate those fish to feed. And I always had a really hard time finding bass, at least consistently, when there wasn't big tides. So when you have sand flats like this, it's actually kind of the complete opposite. These bass don't want huge tides because when you have huge tides, you're gonna have a ton of current and it's not gonna give those bass a ton of time to stage up on there, as well as it's not gonna give the bait a ton of time to stage up on it. So fishing on these sand flats, there's many reasons why I really highly suggest doing them, doing it. And I really found the true power of this one night a few years ago, where it, again, it was probably late July, it wasn't even probably, it was late July and it was the dog days of summer again. Not a whole lot of bass being caught in between the moon phases. And I figured I'd, the, the best conditions, I had a smaller tide and a good wind direction for a specific spot that I like, that I fish in the spring mostly. And it was just the perfect conditions for it and I was doing nothing anywhere else. So I was like, what the heck, I'm just gonna go and fish it. So I get out to the sand flat and I walk out in the water and I'm walking and the moon hadn't rose yet. And it was, it was just dark and I'm walking along and it's pitch black and all of a sudden there's a big explosion. A bass jumps out of the water in front of me. I spooked a bass and it lands in the water scaring me half to death. I look around and I'm surrounded and I can see in the phosphorescence and phosphorescence is an algae that when it's disturbed, it gives off this green hue. And I could see in the phosphorescence bass all around me chasing bait. And I was like, 
this is the craziest thing ever. And I, I was bringing live eels because I wasn't super confident I was going to have a whole lot of action. So I, I put on a live eel and I cast it out. It goes about 20 feet in front of me. I hear it splash in the water. Before I could even get the line on my line roller, my van stall, the, the eel was eaten. As soon as I got the line on it, it starts screaming out, out drag. And I'm losing it because that's just, it was just so quick, I couldn't even believe it. And I end up getting that bass in, it was 46 inches. And I'm like, that was an amazing bass. I can't believe I just caught that first cast. And that one fish would have made my, my night. It was probably the, one of the bigger bass I'd caught up to that point in the season too. And so I was like, that would have basically made my season so far. And little did I know, that fish was actually gonna end up being the smallest bass I would catch <laughs> that night. And I released that bass and I cast it out. The same eel, it's all raggedy now, and I cast that thing out lands in the water again, and bam, it's on, almost instantly again. And this happened from the time I got there at low tide, all the way up to high tide, every single cast. I ended up catching 18 bass over 45 inches that day, and left them, eat, left them biting. And I had a few really, really big ones too. Um, yeah, question? Where is the spot exactly? <laughs> <laughs> secret, secret spot. Uh, yep. Yeah, right. So they're the worst. And as like the regulations have changed a ton for live eels, uh, now you have to use circle hooks when it comes to fishing with live eels. And I like to use, as you can see, I have a mesh kind of laundry bag right there. And what I'll do is I'll get the eels in the laundry bag and I'll try to get my hands on one of their heads and I'll try to kind of poke it up through the hole of the mesh bag. And a lot of the time, they're if you haven't fished with them before, they're impossible to hold on to, like with your bare hands, like absolutely impossible. And so you can't reach your hand in the bag and just grab them because they'll slide right out of your hand. And so I'll try to get the eel just to get its head out of the bag a little bit and I clamp down as hard as I can, as quickly as I can, I'll hook them through the chin and out just behind the eye. And live eels are very durable. Like I, I used to keep them in a fish tank outside and every once in a while they'd get out, of course, because they're insane. And they would crawl onto the driveway in the 80 degrees sun and dry up. And I'd pick them up and I'd throw them back in and they'd swim away in the tank. And I was like, this is the most ridiculous thing of all time. They're super durable. So if you keep them in a laundry bag, you don't have them banging against your leg as you're walking to your spot or anything like that. They're gonna survive. Like they're very hardy. Uh, yeah, they're. I, we'll get more into it. I talk a lot about live eels a little bit later, but they're a, a big confidence thing for me. Yeah. So that's that's good with that. Confidence. Speaking of confidence, is one of the most important things when it comes to surf casting. Without confidence, you might as well not even go like not even go fish because. Every single time I cast, whether I'm delusional or not, I feel like I'm gonna catch a fish. And that's kind of the attitude you kind of have to have when it comes to fishing. Because if you feel like you're not gonna catch a fish, you're probably not gonna catch a fish, even if they're in front of you. Sometimes when things are slow, I'll actually look to certain plugs to gain confidence from. So two plugs that I have a lot of confidence in is number one, the SBH pencil from Pumba Plugs, which you can pass that down. And this is the Magnum Walker from Pumba Plugs, which is a big spook style plug as well. Called it's called a Magnum Walker. Magnum. Yep. Um, and they, that's a big spook style plug. And with both of these lures, from my own past experiences, I've caught a bunch of really big bass with them. So I know that they work. And I have so much confidence in these plugs that when everything's really slow, I'll fish them, and I feel like if I don't get a hit or anything, any action uh, from bass from when I'm fishing, there's probably not fish there, or at least they're not actively feeding. And again, might be wrong, but in my head, I have to think that way in order to just be confident in what I'm doing. Another confidence tactic that I use a lot is live eel. I wish I could try to turn up the volume on this, maybe. Oh, you just woke up. It's a monster. Holy crap. 
So live eels to me are like the ultimate confidence thing because the ultimate confidence tactic because they completely get rid of the whole what am I fish what lure do I have to fish in order to what lure do I have to fish in order to uh, match the bait that those bass are on and it gets rid of all of that because when you're fishing with a live eel, it doesn't matter the structure you're fishing. <laughs> the hype is real on this video. <laughs> so I love fishing with live eels uh, because it gets rid of all of the uh, all of the conf all the uh, guessing between. Let me just replay that while I'm talking. It gets rid of all the, the what bait am I f needing to match and what lure do I have to fish to match that bait. It gets rid of all of that. So the always take an eel even if they're fishing on, uh, feeding on menhaden or mackerel or? Yeah, exactly. So even if they're on something that'd be really picky like sand eels which are really small yeah. or which is a type of bait fish actually or silver sides or anything, doesn't matter. They'll always eat so eels. So the feeding is not always specific. They will take an eel if it's... Yeah, and I mean, part of that's just because, I mean, it's a live eel. It's like a live fish that you're giving it, and they know, like, okay, this is actually a live thing. They can smell it. They can, like, see it. it it's the proper vibrations or whatever. So, like, they know that that's a, a live thing. And I'll fish these no matter the structure. So if I'm fishing beaches, estuaries, rocks, I'll fish live eels. And... They just are such a confidence thing for me. Like I feel like when I'm fishing with a live eel and if there's a big fish in the area at all throughout the night and I cast in front of them, I'm gonna catch it. And you can fish them during the day too. Like they do work during the day. Uh, I would definitely suggest to try to fish them if you're gonna fish them during the day when it's like really nasty weather out. But uh, I think at night they excel. The confidence I get when I see big bass smashing on the surface of the water feeding on bait, when I'm actually seeing that, is the same confidence that I will get when I'm standing at the edge of the water and I have certain conditions. I feel like even if I can't see those bass, I feel like they're under there. What are they feeding on there? Like you can see little tiny fish. Yeah. yeah, so these are feeding on peanut bunker. This is a video from last fall. Yep, drone shot, which was came out amazing. I was out with a guy peanut this bunker, day. Which is peanut bunker is, Hayden? yeah, baby Atlantic Menhaden, yep. Uh, so when they're feeding on baby Atlantic Menhaden like that, oh, yeah. you can see them, um, there's a lot of little, little Menhaden, they're just, and those are all, by the way, those fish are all over 40 inches and probably like, some of them like that guy right there is probably high 40s, I would so assume. Where was this taken? This was off of Gloucester. This is off of the back shore in Gloucester. From a boat? Uh, we had a drone flying out and, and filmed this. This is between Thatcher's and like the back shore. Really? Yep. Would a big bass ever try to take a seagull? Sorry, what? Would a big bass try to take a seagull? I don't think so. I've, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard stories that a blue, like every once in a while, like you'll see a one legged seagull, like maybe a bluefish took their foot off, but I don't know. I don't think the bass will go after him. So one of those conditions that I feel, oh, sorry, yeah. Do you ever use a drone for like, scouting before you actually go? No, I actually haven't done that before, but uh, I, I think like that's a very, like there's people that are out there doing that and they're being very successful doing that too. And a lot of people are, I mean, there's some crazy stuff where people are actually flying bait out and dropping them with drones now. Yeah, it's just absurd. That's a great question. So I use a leader with a barrel swivel attached to about four feet of blue label cigar. So this is the line that I use. I generally use like on average, I'm using like 40 pound blue label cigar. If you actually, we can pass this around, like you guys can feel that. Is that uh, or that that's that fluorocarbon line, yes. Um, and so I'll fish that to a tactical anglers, uh, 70 pound tactical anglers clip. I like that size the best because it's light and so you can still work some smaller lures with it but it also is very powerful and 
I, they're, they're awesome. They give you a little bit extra swing. So like the loop knot you're talking about, where a lot of people like fishing loop knots because they give the lure a little extra action. Yeah, exactly. Like that's why those uh, tactical anglers clips are great. I know you like to jump in the middle. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Do you do the loop knot with the jump in the middle or would you use the clip? So you can get away with the 50 or the 70 pound clip uh, with the the 70 pound tactical anglers clip with the jumping minnow, yeah. but it's definitely better action when you tie direct or have even like the, the 50 or they make like a 25 pound clip now, right. which is like, yeah, if you fish the smaller you go, the better for sure. Right. So one of the conditions that I feel so confident, like I'm gonna catch a bass, I could call my shots is hurricanes. <laughs> Hurricanes tick a lot of the boxes of things we've discussed throughout this seminar. And they are dangerous, very dangerous to fish. But if you look at the set conditions that you get that these, these hurricanes will give you, you can have unbelievable fishing. And this is fishing where I feel like I can call my shots. Like I'm going, when I'm there at the, the standing at the water's edge and I'm about to cast into it, I feel like I'm gonna be able to catch a bass on that first cast. Like I, I just feel it. And it's, that's because again, we, they are big low pressure systems. They move a ton of water and if you, plan, if you game plan for the conditions properly, you can find cool, clean water and those bass generally will be big and aggressive because if they love those conditions, it's their favorite things ever. Picking a spot. Now, this is probably the most important thing that I'm gonna say this entire seminar. And that is fishing with intention or picking a spot with intention is one of the most important things when it comes to catching big fish, especially fish in general consistently. We all know those people, and I've been totally guilty of it too, that catch a big fish in a spot or just a fish in general in a spot, and they fish that same spot regardless of the conditions or any external factors. And they end up growing cobwebs on them because they're not catching anything. Let's take hurricanes for an example. Hurricanes give you very set conditions to game plan for. And if you game plan for these conditions wrong, you're probably not gonna catch fish because it's probably gonna be unfishable. Where if you game plan for these conditions properly, it can be some of the most electric fishing you can do. I mean, it doesn't really get any better than catching big bass on large Danny plugs like this. I don't know if I have that exact one out there, but similar to, to this, I will pass this down too, was what I was fishing on, fishing with that night, or that day and night. But yeah, there, when you game plan properly for hurricane conditions, it is really, really fun. All right, let's look at the exact things that I do and, and think about when it comes to picking a spot and what I would consider picking a spot with intention. So the first thing I look at is the time of year. And we're gonna actually look at Hurricane Lee, for example. So Hurricane Lee happened in September, early September. And because it's early September, that's probably gonna be when the water temperature, not probably, that is when the water temperature is the warmest. And that's good because we got a lot of rocks on Cape Ann and the rocks are gonna be where that water is probably gonna be the coolest. And that's the first thing I look at. Now, the next thing I look at is the wind direction. And the reason I look at the wind direction is because then the wind direction is gonna allow me to game plan for where can I even fish? And it's kind of hard to see, but that's Cape Ann right there. And it's insane. So this is windy.com. This is, you can get an app, windy.com on your phone. This is a great app. I suggest you all download it, it's free. Uh, it's great because it gives you the exact wind direction and it has a lot of other cool features as well. But the wind direction to me is the most important. And so if you look at that, it's absolutely howling in on, from the east. And it is probably blowing with dark blue, purple like that. It's like 70 mile an hour winds, which is just mind blowing. And anything over 60 is basically unfishable. 
if you're trying to fish into the teeth of it. So the whole east side of Cape Ann is gonna be unfishable right now. You got a few places though that are on the north side and on the south side that you could potentially fish and the water would be nice and cool and, and clean and those bass would like to stage up in there. So let's stick with that like mid incoming tide theme because we've been talking about that. So with a mid incoming tide like this, I then would, that's the last thing I'm gonna look for is the tide and I use uh, the Tide app. There's like an app that's called Tides or something and it gives you the moon phase as well. But if you look at that, it's gonna tell you when the tides are and for me, with a mid incoming tide like that, that's gonna give me one or two spots that I'm gonna feel I'm gonna do very, very well with, with these conditions. And I know this because I went out that day and I ended up getting eight bass over 40 inches and my biggest bass of the season, which was 48 inches this year. So, yes. That's another great question. I really like throwing like big spooks uh, or pencils are another great one. I like throwing top water because the bass are gonna come flying out of the water for it. But bucktails are another great one. Any sort of weighted soft plastic to get down into that white water is gonna be very productive as well. Um, yeah, so there are times that everything's not going your way and you're zigging when you should be zagging. You're not catching fish. Maybe your buddies are catching big fish and you're the one that's not catching anything. You're breaking off on fish and it's just, it's not going your way. And those are the times where I kind of try to remind myself that I want to I know that I'm doing the right thing. So I remind myself, you know, I'm, I'm doing the right things. It's only a matter of time before I end up catching a nice fish. Because if I just, and then the other thing I really try to remind myself too is you gotta enjoy the whole process. I find myself getting caught up on, I just, I wanna catch a big fish and that's all I'm focused on and I lose a lot of the, the fun of it. Where if you really just focus on being out there and enjoying being out there and fishing, and the people that do that and enjoy just being out there to fish the most are the ones that have their lures in the water the longest. And they're the ones that seem to just catch the most big fish. I mean, it really makes sense. I'm, so yep. Twin lights up KPM? Yes. Yep. So you guys might be able to figure oh, out yeah. where I might be fishing. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, so. Another really common question I get asked a lot, and when I got asked this question, I actually made me think a little bit because I thought it was gonna be easy to answer, and then the more I thought about it, the harder it was to answer. And that was, how long do you fish at a spot before you move? And it, to me, it really depends on the time of day. And this is very general because in general, I fish this way, but if there's external factors, it can make me change the way that I do this. But in general, I like to take about 10 casts at a spot during the day. Because in my mind, generally again, striped bass during the day are gonna go into a place and they're gonna stage up and opportunistically feed on bait. And when they're opportunistically feeding on bait, if you're in there and you make 10 casts, you're probably gonna get that bass to come up and look at your plug or come up and hit your plug. And if you don't catch anything, then I wanna move and try to cover water. So I'm gonna try to hit as many different spots as I can, cover a lot of water. And I feel like during the day, you're more likely to get your lure in front of a fish that is actively feeding. Now this changes at night. When I fish at night, I think of, I think of striped bass at night. Striped bass are a little bit more actively feeding at night. So if they're in an area, they might move throughout multiple places in a spot that they can, that have good structure, good ambush points throughout a spot and stage up in those different ambush points throughout a tide and feed. And I'm way happier to stay in one spot all night long if I know that that's good structure and that spot could hold a really big fish. Because at some point in my mind throughout that night, there's gonna be a big fish that's gonna move into that area and all I have to do is get my lure in front of it. And so that's kind of my philosophy when it comes to trophy hunting as well, when it comes to trying to catch the biggest fish I can possibly find, is going into a spot that I know is good structure, I know can hold big fish, and just grinding it out in that one spot. All right, if there's one thing you guys can really take away, or a few things you can take away from this podcast, or this podcast, it's basically a podcast, right? This seminar, uh, is, is fishing with intention. 
That's one of the most important things that I think about when it comes to fishing, is trying to fish as intentional as possible. And if you, and also being persistent, like it's tough. It is really, really tough to catch big fish right now. And it's really tough to catch big fish consistently. I know a lot of amazing fishermen and they go out there and get skunked a ton. So you might feel like you're the only one that's not catching anything and Instagram or uh, on social media is like everyone's catching big fish. That is 100% not the case. Everyone has their times where they're doing well, but I'll tell you what, everyone is having a hard time. So being out there, just being persistent and fishing with intention. And if you do follow the general things that we were talking about throughout this uh, seminar, you're going to have, you're either gonna catch more fish or you're gonna catch bigger fish. And I feel very strongly about that. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. You've all been awesome. And if you have any questions at this time, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Where is, that? Where is that? Yeah. Sorry, what was your question? Any great story about catching something other than a bass when you're out there ready hmm. to catch that bass? Any um, fun, uh, let me think. Yeah, I mean, sharks. Oh, I got a good one. I got a good one that, you know, could be a shark story. So I, this is really sad for me. But there was one, one night this past season where there was, I was onto a good bite and I hooked into this fish. And it wasn't really fighting, but I could feel that it was heavy. And it's swimming at me. So I'm like, oh, that's really weird. I'm actually out on a rock. It's about six feet, of, six feet deep behind me, and I'm out on a rock. And the fish swim right at me, and it comes right in. It's about, I don't know, maybe five feet from the rock behind me. And then it wakes up, and it runs 200 yards straight out with this rod. I could not stop it. My drag was locked down. I could not stop that fish, and it runs 200 yards straight, nonstop. And I'm just sitting there, and it's just running and running, and like a freight train, zzz, zzz, just straight out. I could not stop it. And it gets me out into the current that was out there, ends up turning the current, and it's swimming towards these rocks. And I'm grabbing my spool, and I'm pulling, I'm cupping the spool, and I'm pulling up, and I'm pulling, and I feel it tighten up, and it just pulls out of my hand, just just like rips line. I'm like, what the heck is this thing? And it eventually gets me into the rocks and breaks me off. So I don't know. I mean, it could have been a shark, could have been a bass, but it was, it was, or seal, you know, but it, it felt very bass-like to me. So it was, it was tragic, but yeah. Let's go with the bass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the big one that got away, right? What was your question? So we take the photograph. Where are you actually fishing from? That situation. You're out on the point? Yeah, so I was actually out on the point right here. This is a really cool story. So I was out on the point here fishing, and there was a blitz going on out here. And I cast out there, and I'm like, if I hook a fish, I'm done. Because there's another line of rocks actually behind that. You can kind of see there's white water here. And there's another line of rocks that looks like this. And I was casting over that rock. And I cast out there, and that thing eats it. And that's like a mid 30 pound class fish. And it's running to the right. So somehow I end up turning this fish and he turns around and he's, and he's swimming back this way. Meanwhile, my friend Joe Gray, who's an environmental police officer, is watching me from the bank and he comes walking all the way out across these, the bubble weed like that. I can't even believe he made it out there alive. He, he gets out there and he's like, do you want some pictures? And I'm like, oh, that'd be awesome. So then he took this amazing picture with the wave breaking behind me and I ended up landing that fish and it, it's a very memorable fish for me. Yeah. And why, yep. uh, when, you, uh, when you cast one of these pencil lures, for example, into mm -hmm. a school of Menhaden, if they're feeding on Menhaden, why would they, okay, take your lure? So in their minds, they think like, oh, that's an injured bait fish up on the surface of the water, and they're going to try to eat whatever is easiest for them to go after. Even if it doesn't even look close to what they're feeding on. Yeah, so I mean, it doesn't look close to what they're feeding on, but they're seeing splashing, and as you saw with that drone footage, it's kind of chaotic. So if they see that up on the surface, and they're all smashing on bait, they see something move, boom, they smash it, and then you hook into them. Any other questions? Yeah, you in the back. Do you ever fish north and go up to Plum Island? Yes, yeah, so I do fish a fair bit in Plum Island in the spring. Yeah, so the rivers in Plum Island are very, very good in the spring. Yeah. That's a great question. Again, um, I, you know, 
Big tides in general, I think are really good. I, I don't think one necessarily fishes better than the other. I think they both fish very equally, for me at least in my experience, that they've, I've done well with both of them. I've had bad nights with both of them, with at least the both new and full moon big tides. Definitely there's a difference between fishing when there's big moon tides and not fishing when there's moon tides. I definitely think that some people say, well, fishing in between the moon phases, like waning or waxing, whatever, like there's good nights in between that. I personally don't see that happening unless there's external factors that are making those fish feed. But yeah, that's kind of my, my whole thought process with it. Yep. Quick little trade secret question. I noticed on your soft plastics, mm -hmm. you glue them to the heads. Yep. Uh, super glue, Gorilla glue. Yep. Else, yeah, just super glue. I, I've used like the Gorilla super glue. I used, I've used the, uh, they're like, super glue gel. I also have used just like the normal super glue. Sometimes you glue your finger to the jig head, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you put scent on the jig? No, I have not actually. And I know people that do and they say it's very productive to do that. I've personally not experimented with that. Yep. Yep. Is there like one go-to when you're starting out on like a spot to like kind of as like a searcher bait? Ooh, that's a great question too. Um, I really like fishing like a spook, a small spook style plug. I think that overall it's a very enticing lure. And like if you can get that in front of a fish, they're at least going to swirl on it. So then you know that they're, they're in the area. Yep. It's good to see you too. <laughs> Any other questions? So when you're fishing those rock reels every day, yep. Yep. I tend to find I'm always snagging up in there, no matter mm. what I do, right? Even in yep. higher tide and trying to keep it. What's your trick? As you had said earlier, you bounce that off the bottom, let it drift with the current kind of drop. Yep. <laughs> There's no good trick for it. You know, I, I'll tell you what, I do snag a fair amount on the bottom too. You just gotta, like, I try to fish as light as possible. That's really my trick. If I can fish as light as it goes with a jig head, that's why I don't generally fish anything over a half ounce because I feel like I'm gonna snag on the bottom. But yeah, like I'll snag a lot too. So it's just part of the game, I guess, when you're fishing off the rocks. Yep, any other questions? Awesome, I think that's it. Oh. Uh, oh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so here's, this is uh, funny. So I, what I'll do is I have a camera that I'll put on uh, time-lapse mode. And I got autofocus, and every three seconds it will take a photo, and I have a DSLR that I put an external flash just on the top of it. And I'll tell you what, for every probably 100 photos I take, I probably get one that's good. So there's a lot of photos that are just blurry or don't come out well, and it's just part of the game. You just gotta take a lot to get some good shots. Yep. Great pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. When it's all said and done, and you're out of the water, mm -hmm. do you use any salt wash, or do you just stand in the shower? Yeah. So I have a hose, and I hose down my gear every single time I, I finish fishing. Both my rods, my bag, my boots, everything. Hose it all down. Yep. You don't Very important. Run above with, with the water. Or? No, not not too crazy. Just like you know, a couple of seconds, just spraying it down. Yeah, nothing too crazy. Yep. 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 And were you? Self-taught, or did families teach you, get you into this, or well, did you just find it? And yeah, like I grew up really close to the beach, so I would always walk to the beach and fish, and my dad took me out fishing, and then I have people like Steve Pappas, who has taught me a lot of stuff the last couple of years. I mean, he's a real legend, sarcastic around here too, so, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so all you have to do if you want any of the, the Danny plugs is just email him and be like, hey, can I have a Danny plug? And he'll make it for you. Yep. They're kind of specialty orders, but yeah, he's totally cool with me. Yeah. Yeah. I want him to put them out online, but I think it's just hard for him to make them. So, yeah. But they're pretty f affordable, too, as far as Danny plugs go. He'll only charge you like $24, $25 for them, so, which is nice because most of the time they're like $50, $60, $100. It's like, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So I'll be packing up if you have any other questions or you want to come up to me and ask me anything, feel free. All right.